And now it's time for a quick biogeographical and historical slant on one of our most favoritest recreational drugs on the planet, and that would be alcohol. Now, alcohol is the stuff that's in wine, but it's also the same stuff that's in beer and in harder spirits, and indeed it is a drug. We don't often think of it that way, but a drug is any substance that is, uh, or when it's inhaled or smoked or injected or consumed or any other way you get it into the body that causes a physiological change in the mind slash body, that's a drug. Now, I don't know that alcohol is the most used drug on the planet. That specific title may go to coffee, uh, caffeine, or aspirin, or even nicotine uh, that's in tobacco. These are all products that are widely used, like a lot of usage. I think caffeine, coffee, I think, is the number one drug in America when we're talking about usage. I know a lot of folks think, when they think drugs, they think of narcotics or the illegal drugs like marijuana or cocaine or heroin. All of those drugs really pale in comparison to things like nicotine, caffeine, and alcohol when you're talking about how many people are using it, and how much of it's being used. So, alcohol may not be the most used drug on the planet right this second, but I can assure you it's been the drug used the longest in human history. <laughs> that's right. So that's what, what alcohol's been around since the birth of civilization, if not earlier. I don't know about all these other, aspirin wasn't around, nicotine wasn't around, cigarettes weren't around, alcohol was. So it has a very long lineage. It's one of the reasons why it's so important into uh, the human history and civilization itself. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I define what a drug is, right? What about these other terms I used? A biogeographic slant on alcohol? Biogeography, it's a great word. It's a subfield of study within geography. And it's a study of the factors influencing the distribution of plants and animals across the planet approach from an ecological, historical, and cultural perspective. All these things we use mostly for food, but for other things that humans have manipulated and moved all over the place. Human influence on biotic patterns such as crop domestication, habitat alteration, species introductions, and even extinctions, uh, and environmental management issues, environmental change is a primary focus of biogeography. Bio, life, plants and animal stuff. And we're going to do some biogeography for alcohol in this little lecture. So what's alcohol? You all know what alcohol is. But in general usage, alcohol, and it's from an Arabic word, by the way, alcohol. Uh, Arabic writers and scientists were the first to kind of uh, uh, distill out pure alcohol and name it. So alcohol, an Arabic word, uh, in general usage refers to uh, ethanol alcohol, ethyl alcohol also known as grain alcohol, a.k.a. grain alcohol. And really, it has become kind of a generic term that applies to any beverage that has ethyl alcohol in it. Alcoholic beverages have been widely consumed since antiquity by civilizations around the world, perhaps even pre-civilizations alcohol was being used. Why? As part of a standard diet, as part of cuisine, for hygienic reasons, for their relaxing effects, for their medicinal effects, for recreational purposes, and a host of other reasons. Many alcohols, of course, have been imbued or invested with serious symbolic and religious significance in rite and rituals for major world religions. Thus, they've been propagated as a agricultural commodity that's of a much higher ranking in terms of the importance to the human psyche and the human experience. Now, that's what alcohol is. Now you know what biogeography is. Of course, for this class, uh, I'm going to invent a whole new field of study that I heartily encourage you all to go into research in, and that is let's combine the two. Let's combine alcohol and biogeography and have a new branch of study called alcobiogeography. <laughs> and that would be a study of the factors influencing the distributions of those particular plants that are the base ingredients for alcohol, as approached from ecological, historical, and cultural perspectives. Human influences on those plants used for producing alcohol will be the primary focus. 
as would be the impacts alcohol production has had on defining cultural landscapes. Think about that. Where's sake from? All of you just said Japan. Where's tequila from? All of you just said Mexico. We imbue certain cultural characteristics and even define some cultures and their products by alcohol. That, that alcohol's from there. Why? Because those places had particular plants that they used to make into alcohol. See, it's kind of a reinforcing circle. So, alco biogeography, look it up. You can't look it up, I just invented it. Anyway, back to alcohol itself and a brief kind of historical summary here. As I've suggested now three times, Alcohol's been around as long as civilization itself, if not before. Alcohol can occur naturally, meaning that it can accidentally happen in rotting fruit or if somebody left some grain-based porridge sitting out too long, fermentation will occur naturally and an alcoholic product can actually just happen. And people, of course, stumbled across this early on, again, maybe even pre-civilization. There are those archaeologists, anthropologists, historians who suggest that al the desire for alcohol may have been a really big reason why people started to settle down and grow agricultural products and move from being hunter-gatherers to being sedentary food-growing people. Food's great, but alcohol's really great. Humans, even in primitive societies, figured out the plants and processes to make alcohol long time ago. And we, humans, have been tweaking it every year for 10,000 years, figuring out better and better ways to do it and figuring out other plants we can use to make different types of stuff. And that is a storyline which continues on up to today. People are still expanding the repertoire of alcoholic beverages that are available to us in different flavors from different places and different plants all the time. An ongoing story. Now, alcohol is different than all other food crops in that, or I shouldn't say all other food crops, producing alcohol is different from regular food in other parts of your diet in that the mystical of otherworldliness properties of intoxication are pretty important on the human psyche. So you can eat potatoes, you can eat corn, you can eat your grain, you can eat your grain-based porridge. You can consume water, you can consume milk. And these things will keep you alive. But when you consume alcohol, now you're getting into a spiritual experience. I know you just drink alcohol to get drunk in today's world, and maybe they did 10,000 years ago too. But again, it's a drug. And it alters your mind, and it alters your behavior, and it alters your perception. Uh, and it's quite important as an almost rite and ritual of early civilization that people would have perhaps even invented the gods while they were intoxicated and in an otherworldly state. Other foodstuffs don't do that to you. Alcohol does. So again, it's part of the reason why it picks up some importance fairly quickly in the human world and human history. And uh, there are other drug plants, to be sure, but none of them have been as accessible in all parts of the planet as alcohol has been. So heroin, whoo, that will whack you out way more and really impact the human psyche way more than, say, a glass of alcohol. But heroin's from a very certain place on planet Earth, and it takes many processes to get to the point where you've injected into your uh, a bloodstream, and so that comes much later. Even marijuana is something you can smoke, but that's from a different part of the planet. Uh, and, and cocaine, a different part of the planet that had to be uh, processed and figured out over a long period of time before it got to its current usage today, its current state and current usage. Alcohol has been with humans forever, almost everywhere. Almost all early societies, as I'm reinforcing, figured out that, hey, what are the plants around here that we can manipulate in some way to produce this mind-altering beverage? So the accessibility of alcohol is also not to be underestimated because you can make alcohol from pretty much any plant material. You can't say that about virtually really any other drug. And because of all these properties put together, the plants that you make alcohol out of and the alcohol products themselves become ingrained into the cuisine, the culture, the mythology, and the religions of the societies in which they were consumed. And again, over time, start to define, help define the cultures of those societies themselves. Again, 
tequila we think of as a very distinctively Mexican thing. Why? Because the plant is originally from there and over, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of years, the people in this place figured out how to manipulate this plant into an alcoholic beverage that is wildly distinct. You don't get tequila that tastes like tequila anywhere else besides Mexico for all of these reasons put together. Got it? That's just, again, very brief historical rundown of why alcohol is so important. What type of alcohol are we talking about here again? We're talking about one specific type called ethyl alcohol or ethanol. Again, AKA grain alcohol because a lot of it's made from grain, go figure. Uh, and you should be aware that there are many other types of alcohols. For you chemists out there, uh, very quickly, name off all the other alcohols. Alcohols are a whole branch of chemistry, I think, uh, or, or branch of compounds. I don't know, I'm not a chemist. But I know that there are other alcohol combinations that aren't ethyl, and they are things like methanol, AKA wood alcohol, isopropyl, AKA isopropyl rubbing alcohol, uh, butanol, the, uh, AKA biobutane, uh, even glycerol. Now, none of these other alcohols are drugs. I mean, I, I guess you could drink a bunch of methanol and it'll kill you, so that's affecting your physiology, but most of the other ones are lethal in high amounts, but none of them get you drunk is the point I'm trying to make here. So of all the alcoholic beverages on planet Earth, uh, they're all made from ethyl alcohol in all of them. In whiskey, in rum, in Budweiser beer, and Guinness beer. In port wine, in cherry wine, in red wine from Italy, and white wine from China. All of the properties in there that get you inebriated, they're all from the exact same alcohol that is ethyl alcohol. Okay. Got that. So where do we get this ethyl alcohol from? If it's the same in all this great variety of alcohols out there, alcoholic beverages, how do we derive this stuff? This stuff we love so much because it does something to our system. It's all really based on the same formula. That is the production of ethyl alcohol. It's a pretty simple, straightforward formula. And it's a simple sugar that gets broken down via these interesting little critters we'll call yeast. Now the chemical breakdown is something to the effect of C6H12O6 gets evolved or devolved, I don't know which way it goes, into two parts carbon dioxide plus two parts C2H5OH, that's the ethyl alcohol part. I should also add in this chemical combination, in this chemical formula, when you take that simple sugar, C6H12O6, and break it down into these constituent parts, you're also going to release a whole bunch of heat. What? Heat? Yes, whenever you're producing alcohol, you're going to produce the ethyl alcohol itself, carbon dioxide. Hey, wait a minute, you know what carbon dioxide is. If you trap carbon dioxide in your alcohol, it's called carbonation. It's what makes beer fizzy or champagne fizzy. So uh, most of the uh, ethyl alcoholic products that are produced, they just let that CO2 escape. So most still wine, table wine, see how I'm working those terms in already? Most wine is still, they've let the CO2 escape. All uh, distilled products, all liquors, they're all still, there's no CO2 in that, you just let that stuff escape. But you can trap it if you want to make your beer fizzy. But when you break down that sugar, you get carbon dioxide, the ethyl alcohol that you want for your product and heat, which means when you are making this stuff, heat is actually, it's bubbling because CO2 is bubbling up out of the, the mixture and heat's being released. When you are producing ethyl alcohol via this thing we're going to call brewing, uh, it, it, without heat, it's just doing it on its own and it will look like a boiling pot of lava, which also feeds into the mystical nature of alcohol itself. When you are producing alcohol from a base sugar, it will be bubbling and full of life and hot to the touch, like life itself, with no fire underneath. You're not cooking it, it's just doing it. How does this happen? You have to add one more little element, which is naturally occurring all over the place, so you really don't even have to add it, and they're called yeast. Yeast uh, added to any simple sugar solution 
Think of fruit juice or Kool-Aid, whatever. Simple sugar solution. Throw in some yeast, and these yeast do this one simple little thing. They eat all the sugar they can get, and they're the ones that kick out the CO2, the ethyl alcohol, and heat is pushed off during the process. Now, and that's all these critters do. They're awesome. They're some of the most magical creatures the heavens have put on the earth for us because they're producing all the ethyl alcohol that we all like in all these beverages. Now, before we get to the source of these simple sugars, maybe we should expand on this yeast thing for just a second because these are fascinating little critters. I am not a biologist, okay? I'm pretty clueless, you guys know me, so I only have a tangential understanding of yeast. And you know what? I'm not alone, because even scientist types are really not sure how to categorize these things called yeast. They are specialized, single-celled organisms, maybe, uh, in the fungus category, maybe, with 600 to 1600 different species. Maybe. Now, why am I saying maybe after all this? Because these critters are so unique that some scientist types and biologist types and botanist types, I guess, are looking at this and saying, you know what, they're so unique, they really shouldn't be in the fungi category. They're not true funguses like mushrooms and stuff. They don't behave the same way. They do different things. And they're not really an animal, so they don't go in the animal kingdom. They're not a plant, so they don't go in the plant. And we're not, we've stuck them in fungi because we're not sure where the hell else to put them. But they may be getting their own family, their own kingdom soon. That's how unique these guys are. And we say they're single cell mostly, although we're not exactly sure. Uh, and we say 600 to 1600 species. Yeah, those are the ones we know about. But there's great variation in them. So this little critter that does this magical feat of engineering, of taking a simple sugar and making it into ethyl alcohol, is quite mysterious and quite awe-inspiring in and of itself, okay? Now, as I just suggested, there's at least 600, maybe 1,600, maybe 16,000 species of yeast. The one that we are most concerned with when we're talking about the ethyl alcohol story is one called Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Cerevisiae? Cerevisiae? Cerveza. That sounds like cerveza. If I was back in Mexico before I got my tequila, I might order a cerveza. It's beer. And Saccharomyces cerveza is brewer's yeast, a particular strain of yeast that does this exact action that we're talking about. Some of these other yeasts, these other <laughs> thousands of yeast that are out there, some of them also might ferment uh, uh, a simple sugar into alcohol. Some of them don't do that. Some of them do lots of other crazy things. But the one we're most concerned with is these particular strain that does this. And it's a magical organism that has its one sole purpose in life, and that is to make alcohol out of a simple sugar. The yeast will go into any solution that has a basic accessible sugar to it, and by accessible I mean a simple sugar like sucrose or fructose, it's fruit sugar, uh, and the yeast will eat that sugar, spit out the CO2 and alcohol. That process, jot this down, that process that the yeast are doing is called fermentation. And again, I, I open this lecture by saying, yeah, and this can actually kind of happen naturally. It can because yeast are floating all around us right now. They're in the air in front of you. you. They are everywhere. So if you just smash up some fruit juice on your kitchen counter and let it hang out there, it's gonna start fermenting. Fruit rotting on the ground underneath an apple tree, it, yeast are there and they'll start fermenting on the spot. So this is kind of a natural process that will occur. Fermentation. Got it? And by the way, I can tell you that you have seen yeast without even knowing it. For those of you who've ever baked bread, you've used yeast as well to make the bread rise. Ha! Ah, there's another thing yeast do. Uh, however, if you've ever been in the grocery store eating grapes, just table grapes, uh, whether they're green or black or red, have you ever looked at a grape and right up where the little stem is going into the fruit itself, it's like white. And there's like, sometimes there's like white streaks going down. There's even a white haze on the outside of the grape. That's all yeast, my friends. Naturally, little microorganisms that are just hanging out all over the place. So when they go to work on a simple sugar, and they'll do it in the grape itself, or in an apple itself, or any sugar water sitting around, when they go to work, it's called fermentation. By the way, there are tons 
tons of foods that you eat every day that are produced or a product of fermentation. Maybe a third of the products in the grocery store shelves that you consume on a daily basis are the products of fermentation. Things like salami, cheese, beer and wine you know about, but there's a host of others. Maybe I should do a whole separate lecture just on that, like sauerkraut and kimchi. Fermentation. Ah, but back to the story. Yeast are going to go to work doing fermentation. When it happens naturally, you just call it fermentation. Spontaneous fermentation. When we humans get involved and start manipulating and controlling it with the purposes of making alcohol, we call that brewing. Fermentation is natural. Brewing is when we make it happen because we want to get that ethyl alcohol. Got it? Okay. Now back to the alcohol itself. Ethyl alcohol is quite special because it has these effects, these physiological effects on the human mind, and actually animals get drunk too, so it has the same effect on them. And animals actually will naturally seek out alcohol. I'm not making this up. Hit me up for personal stories if you want to know about them. But the other thing that's special about ethyl alcohol, besides its inebriating effects, is that it is completely and utterly odorless and tasteless and colorless, okay? It, l it looks like water, and when it's 100% pure, you will have no, there's nothing to taste. There's nothing to smell. Now, I know what some of you are thinking already. Oh, no, 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 boy, you're totally wrong. I've had grain alcohol before. Oh, my gosh. And it smelled like isopropyl rubbing alcohol. Or you've had a really cheap vodka that was completely clear, and you're like, oh, well, all this is is, is ethyl alcohol and water, so it just should taste like water. Oh, but it doesn't, boy. Or I had cheap vodka, and it tasted like or smelled like crappy rubbing alcohol. And then when I drank the grain alcohol, oh, you're saying it's tasteless? No way. I tasted all this stuff. And I always ask people, okay, well, what did you taste? When you do a straight shot of grain alcohol, something I highly recommend against, highly recommend against ever doing that, uh, but for people that have done it or even done straight shots of nasty vodka, what does it taste like? Well, what, what does it taste like? And the answer I most often get is, like fire, ah, like death, like burning, searing sensation, or, and maybe it smells like isopropyl rubbing alcohol or some other nasty butane stuff. And let me explain it to you. Pure, I said pure, pure ethyl alcohol, no color. No odor, no taste. That's pure. You rarely get it in pure form. It's almost impossible even in a laboratory setting to get 100% pure ethyl alcohol. And by the way, that's not the way they sell it. We'll talk about percentages of alcohol throughout this course as well, but most even high test alcohols, alcoholic products I should say, like whiskey or scotch, uh, they're only about 40% ethyl alcohol by volume. The rest is water or other stuff, okay? So you never get it up to 100%. And even if you did get a 99% grain alcohol, and I've seen some 90% alcohol sold in the ABC store, you what you're smelling, what you think you're smelling, you're, uh, you say, I smell ethyl alcohol. No, you don't. You might actually smell isopropyl alcohol or butane because in the processing of these uh, uh, products, in parts per million, it can have isopropyl, or even methanol in it. And those things are terrible, nasty. And even in parts per million or parts per billion, we can smell and detect them and they're terrible. So if you get a really cheap, cheap, cheap vodka and you think it smells like all these other alcohols, it probably does because those other alcohols are in there in trace amounts, but they're so nasty you still smell them. But you're not smelling the ethyl alcohol. Okay, how about the flavor then? You think you taste fire when you drink a high percentage ethyl alcohol product. You ain't tasting nothing. You're not tasting the ethyl alcohol. It doesn't taste like nothing. And if you had it 100% pure, it would actually be like water. But what you are detecting is not a taste. You're detecting a tactile sensation. When you start to drink alcohols that are 40, 50, 60, or up to 90% ethyl alcohol, it don't taste like nothing, but it's too much for the human organism to handle, and you're actually essentially burning the inside of your mouth off when you drink it that way. So you're ripping off, the, the alcohol is ripping off the layer of epidermis in your mouth and in your esophagus when you drink it. 
So you ain't tasting anything, you're physically getting burned. And that's why you say, I taste fire. You don't taste nothing, you feel pain. You're feeling a tactile sensation, you're not detecting a smell or a taste. So ethyl alcohol, to restate, is 100% no color, no odor, no flavor, no matter what you think. Everything, everything, all the flavor you're getting is something else going on there. And this ethyl alcohol is produced by this awesome, simple little organism in a simple sugar solution via a very simple process. Okay, so if all this is so simple and ethyl alcohol don't taste like nothing or smell like nothing or look like nothing, how is it that we have literally hundreds of thousands of different alcoholic beverages to choose from? I could be underestimating there. Maybe it's millions of different alcoholic beverages to choose from, especially if you start talking about different labels. Think about all the beers you see in the, uh, uh, just in the supermarket, or all the alcohol types you see when you go to the liquor store, or all the wineries that exist on planet Earth that are all making unique wines. If the base component that's so important, ethyl alcohol, is identical in all of these products, how can they be so different? How can you have a Bud Light and a Guinness and a Bailey's Irish Cream and a Scotch Whiskey and a Bourbon Whiskey and a Sake and a Tequila and a Rolling Rock and uh, a, a, a Nebbiolo from Italy and a Bordeaux Red and a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc? How can they all have the same element in it? All those beverages taste wildly different. Ah, I've said now that all these alcoholic beverages have a percentage of ethyl alcohol in them. It's never 100%. That would taste like nothing. It would hurt like hell and it would taste like nothing. All of these alcoholic beverages only have a percent. Sometimes it's 5%. Sometimes it's 10% ethyl alcohol. Sometimes it's 40% ethyl alcohol. But even in a 40% ethyl alcohol, say Jim Beam, that means it's 60% something else. In a 5% by uh, a volume alcoholic beer, it means it's 95% something else. An average wine, maybe 15%. That means it's 85% oh, alcohol. That means it's 85% something else. It's the something else that gives all of those alcoholic beverages all of the flavor, all of the aroma, all of the uniqueness that is each one of those beverages. Does that make sense? A little bit? Yeah? I'll go ahead and cut to the chase. It's probably no great mystery to you. What do you think that the vast majority of the other percentage stuff is? 85% of wine is something else. 95% of beer is something else. What is the something else? It's mostly water. So now we have two different products which are colorless, odorless, and taste like nothing. Ethyl alcohol and water combined actually are the vast majority of any alcoholic beverage. Now, I don't know the percentages, and it doesn't matter, but it's probably something like 90, 95, 98% of all these alcoholic beverages is ethyl alcohol and water. Well, that makes it even more confusing then. Are you saying, Boyer, that really only 2 or 3 or 5%? Actually, it's not even that. It's only like 2 the 2% of any of these alcoholic beverages, in this vast array of alcoholic beverages, only 2% is what makes the difference between a scotch and a, and a Bud Light. Yeah, because it's only that little 2% is all of the goodness that's making all these things different. Okay, let's talk about then how do you get just in this little percent that's left all of the great variation of aroma and flavor in all these beverages. It's the different biological materials used to produce that alcohol which make all of the difference even if we're only talking about one or two percent in each different type of beverage. Now some biological elements we've referred to already like yeast. We got it and we have already pointed out that there's perhaps thousands of different types of yeast and these yeast as they're going to work actually different yeast can impart different flavors, minute amounts, but different flavors into the beer. The, the presence of yeast itself, dead yeast hanging out in a beverage will actually give some flavors to the beverage. We'll get to that way later in the lecture. But there are also other crazy microscopic components of brewing that you perhaps have never heard of and never seen because they're microscopic. And these are things like enzymes which naturally exist on certain grains like barley. 
and they help with enzymatic action to help convert barley, which is a starch, into a simple sugar, and they may add some things. And there's other crazy biological elements like molds that are actually used to produce some types of alcohol. I'll do a whole separate lecture on this if you like, but I think it's pronounced Aspergillus oryzae is a mold. It's a fungus. It's a straight up mold. It's not like yeast. It's, there's no confusion. This is a mold. And you probably have heard about this mold because it's what's put on rice in order to make some enzymatic action to turn rice into a simple sugar, which we're going to turn into sake. So that's just a couple examples of things that are out there which do contribute some flavor to the finished product. However, the main, main, main biological material that contributes most of the unique flavor to unique beverages is the plant material itself. What are you starting with? Now we're getting back to, we need a simple sugar, right? We need a simple sugar to put the yeast in so they can start making ethyl alcohol. Okay, where are you gonna get that simple sugar? And the answer is plants. We need some material that has a simple sugar in it naturally, like sucrose or fructose, and fruit has that, uh, or something that can be converted into a simple sugar, namely starch. And grains and other things have starch. So where are you gonna get that simple sugar from? All of the plant material that's found across planet Earth. Now, I'm, I'm going out on a limb a little bit here, and my biologist or brewing friends can maybe correct me, but I think pretty much all plant life could be used because all of it has some sort of sugar or starch element in it. So any plant life could be used to be made into some sort of alcoholic beverage. That's a stretch, and I'm not even sure it's correct, but... All plants, I think, have at least a starch or a sugar component in them, and you would have to heavily manipulate some plants at some point in order to get enough sugar out to make it into a negligible amount of alcohol, but I think it can be done. But there are a whole lot of plants that have a lot of sugar readily available or a lot of starch readily available that can be converted into a simple sugar, and those are the ones that we prefer. And those are the ones that humans have preferred for, I don't know, 10,000 or 15,000 years, <laughs> because it's, it's ready-made little natural packages of sugar or would-be sugar that are ready to go for you to make into alcohol. N name all of the plants that you can think of that we make into alcohol. Ready and go. There you go. I think all of you simultaneously yelled out every single fruit and grass that's out there. Uh, things like grapes, because we're taking a class on wine. Uh, but really any fruit, peaches, prunes, nectarines, uh, pretty much any fruit under the sun you, is in a natural, simple sugar, fructose, sucrose format. You can make them into alcohol, mostly. We'll talk about some exceptions later. And the other big category is grain. And grain is mostly starch, but we can manipulate that fairly readily and make it into a simple sugar as well. And there's even some oddball ones out there. Again, I keep stressing that humans forever all over the place have looked around their natural environments and seen the plants that are there and said, can we eat that plant for starters? And can we turn it into alcohol? <laughs> so because people have always done that pretty much everywhere, you get some plants that you can, would never imagine can be turned into alcohol that can. Sugar cane is uh, one that pops into uh, my head where of course that's sweet already. That's simple sugar ready to go. Okay. And sugar cane's been made into uh, rocky and rum the world over for thousands of years. Uh, but also crazy things like potatoes. Really? You can make potato. Yeah. Sugar beets? That's another vegetable. Yeah. You could process some sugar out of those pretty quick. Um, even crazy ones like things that look like cactus to us, but they're actually in the succulent category, uh, blue agave, the agave plants. And we're back to tequila again. That's the stuff you make into tequila. And if you look at that, you're thinking, no way, I can't eat that. What the hell could you possibly do with that? Oh, by the way, you could make it into some really high test alcohol. That's what people figured out. So really plant materials from around the world, and I'm sure there's a host of other crazy stuff that I haven't thought of, but plant materials the world over uh, can be made into alcohols, some of them much more easily and some of them much more successfully than other plants. And those are the plants that societies have picked out over time and said, yeah, we're going to use this. It's really good. We get a high extraction rate of sugar. Thus, we can get a high extraction rate of alcohol and it's really good. And we like it, the flavors that it works for us. Now, back to uh, uh, the idea that alcohol forms part of local culture, helps define culture. 
we keep, I keep coming back to uh, 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 Japan and Mexico. Where is sake from? Your, your head just says, Japan. Uh, where is tequila from? Uh, obviously, that's Mexico. Uh, in Europe, who drinks beer? That's the Germans. Who drinks wine? That's the French and the Italians. Why is we have such strong correlation with these particular alcoholic beverages in places? Because that's the plant materials that these places had. And over time, that's what they made their alcohols into. And over more time, that's what they become famous for. And it's part of their, again, their diet, their cuisine, their culture. So we can easily make beer anywhere in the world. But we still think of German beer. Can you make sake in Florida? Sure you can. But it don't make sense, does it? Can you make uh, I don't know, tequila in South Africa? Sure you can. But it seems weird, doesn't it? Because that plant's not from South Africa. I only pick on these details because, by the way, you actually can get a lot of really great sake out of California now. And South Africa is indeed, they've transplanted blue agaves and they're going to have a tequila industry soon. So in today's world, we can move these plants and materials around all over the place to make these alcoholic beverages all over the place. And people are doing it. But that don't defy history. We still have a very strong concept of this is from here because the plant was from there and they produce this alcohol from there for a very long time and they're famous for it. I didn't even pick on some easier ones like scotch from Scotland. Talk about identifying culture. It's identifying part of the country name. So that's why certain things are from certain places, although it's not getting all jumbled up in today's world. Now, which ones of these plants are the best for alcohol production? Different categories have pros and cons. When it comes to fruits, they have a lot of pros. Fruit, and again, just think about it, pretty much any fruit in the world, it's already in a simple sugar format. Awesome. The yeast can go to work. Many of them, like grapes uh, or apples or peaches, you can just squeeze them really hard and it, the juice just drips out. So it's already in solution. Another big plus. And there's a high amount of sugar in fruit. Another big plus. The higher amount of sugar, the more alcohol you can make. So fruit, big pluses for alcohol, for ethyl alcohol production. What are some of the cons? Well, fruit is, it rots quickly. And most of it's seasonal, depending on where you're at in what part of the world. So you only get one shot at it a year. That brings us to the next big category, grains. Now, grains uh, are more challenging because they're not in a simple sugar format. So we're gonna have to bust them up, mess them up, cook them, do some, we're gonna have to manipulate them to get them to go into a sugar format. But the big pro is grain is storable. So you can make alcohol from grain any time of the year in any part of the planet. And you can even transport grain from here to the other side of the planet, make beer with it there. And people are doing that too. So it doesn't have as much sugar, so you don't get as much alcohol as you do from say an average fruit, but it's more storable and transportable and therefore it's more flexible. And that's pretty good too. Other things like the succulents and blue agaves and sugarcane, they all have their unique attributes as perhaps their big pro. Meaning, you know what? Tequila tastes like tequila and you ain't faking that from nothing else. It's quite distinct. Even in parts per billion, we can detect those exact little flavonoids and the aromas out of tequila. It's quite potent quite unique. We, most of us like unique. So different plants, even though it may be challenging to make them into alcohol, and agave is one of those, but you can't get it anywhere else. So it's, it's awesome for its uniqueness. So there are pros to all of these. And this sets up the kind of classic dichotomy of how you're going to make your alcoholic beverage. It's the grape versus the grain. Is it fruit or grain? These other ones are kind of oddballs that will pick apart a little bit as the uh, semester rolls on. So first and foremost, point one of why there's a great diversity of ethyl alcohol products, point one is what plant material are you getting your sugar from? What attributes does it have that go through to the finished alcoholic beverage? Again, very simply put, think about the difference between tequila and apple cider and a German wheat beer three different plant materials, three wildly different tasting alcoholic beverages that all have ethyl alcohol at the base of them. Makes sense? Okay. We can continue expanding out the differences between these alcoholic products with number two, the processing. 
meaning that once whatever we do to all of those plants to get them into a simple sugar format, we're going to throw in the yeast and the yeast are going to go to work. The yeast don't care where the simple sugar's from. They could care less. They just want to eat it and make alcohol. Those little darlings. Thank God for you, yeast. They're just going to do it. However, humans who are doing this fermenting intentionally, and remember we call that brewing, they can manipulate the processing during fermentation. And I'm not going to go through all of the different steps and all of the different things that humans can do, but I'll just point out a few. Uh, humans can pick which type of yeast goes in there. They can pick which type of mold goes on the right. They can pick which plant material. So initially, they have a lot of say in what this finished product is going to taste like by what they put into it. But during the processing, they can, they can change the temperature of the fermentation itself, and that in and of itself will change the flavors. When we have a whole electron beer, I'll teach you that ales are hot, more warmly or hotly fermented beers, and lagers are cool fermentation. And that one simple difference makes for different tasting beer. True story. Brewers can also determine if they're going to store or mature their alcoholic beverage in an oak barrel versus stainless steel. And one will impart flavor, the other won't. Uh, they can choose to filter their beer or filter their wine or not. And all of these things will actually impart some flavor or take some flavors out. So the brewer can manipulate aroma and flavor during the processing. And then of course, at the end of that processing, you need to ask the question, okay, well, what am I going to do with this? What, what is the brewer going to do with this alcoholic beverage they've just created? When it comes to beer, typically the answer is, drink it. Uh, beer is much like bread, and the fresher it is, the better it is. So we're not really going to store it, we're not going to age it. There are exceptions, of course, but most beer is, you make it, it's like bread at your local bakery. When do you want it? As soon as it comes out of the oven. So with beer, you usually drink it. Go. With wine, most wines, including reds, but definitely most whites, as soon as you finish baking it, you drink it. I know people think, oh, aren't you supposed to age all wines and all wines get better with age forever? No, that's a fallacy. We'll talk about that more later. But with most wine, you make it, you go ahead and drink it. But there are some wines that you do want to actually store. Age it, let it chill out. Let it sit somewhere for a year or two or five or ten. And that simple procedure will radically change the composition and the smells and aromas of the beverage itself. When it comes to distilled products that we call liquor, as soon as they're good to go, they're good to go and they last forever. No bacteria or other agents can get in there and kill it because it's too high proof. So with most liquors, you can drink them right now, you can drink them next week, you can drink them 20 years from now, they're not going to change at all. However, some can store it, okay? And when it comes to producing liquor itself, what you're going to do is take either wine or beer and distill it, that is purify it, that is take out some of the water to concentrate the ethyl alcohol. So all of the things that I'm talking about here are ways that a brewer or a distiller can process that alcoholic beverage to make it taste different. But make no bones about it, again, it's the initial plant material that gives most of the flavor. The processing can manipulate the flavor slightly, or actually some, sometimes uh, a bit more. If you're gonna age a wine or even a liquor in an oak barrel for a long time, that can impart significant flavor, okay? So, plant material one, two, the processing. And three, these alcoholic products are defined by their alcoholic content. And that's rolling numbers one and two together into number three here. How, what are the major branches of the alcoholic beverages? These are things you know already. Why are they different? Why is wine stronger than beer? Why is liquor stronger than wine? Why does some last why, uh, a long time? Why does some go bad immediately? A lot to do with how strong the stuff is. Beer, on average, on average, we're always talking averages here. There are always exceptions, especially in today's crazy world. But an average beer is anywhere from 4 to 8% ethyl alcohol by volume. Again, that means it's 92 to 96% something else, mostly water. But 4 to 8% uh, by volume ethyl alcohol in beer. Wine, generally speaking, 8 to 16% ethyl alcohol by volume. Liquor, 
anywhere from 25 to 100 percent ethyl alcohol by volume although you never see it at 100 percent most liquor please jot it down in your brain most liquor is around the 40 percent mark now when liquor is being made they can make it up to 99 percent ethyl alcohol but what would be the point it wouldn't taste like anything it wouldn't smell like anything and it's such a high amount, a high percentage of alcohol, it sears out the inside of your mouth and will kill you if you drink it too quickly. The human body can't absorb alcohol that quickly. So stop doing the shots. Relax. It's all about moderation. You know the old drill. You, you do one beer or one glass of wine or one shot per hour. That's so you won't get a DUI, right? That's about how fast the body can process it, and that's that. So you could do 20 shots uh, in one hour if you like, but you're wasting your time. Your body's only gonna get so drunk in the next five minutes, and you're likely to die if you keep pushing it. So the bigger question here is not how what's the proper drinking behavior. Hopefully you know that already. I will reinforce the proper behavior, though. Why is this? Why is it that beer is only, say, 5%, wine's 15 and liquor's 40 possibly 100 Back to the basic formula. What's the basic formula? A simple sugar, yeast thrown in. They'll eat all the sugar, they'll produce alcohol as long as there's sugar there, or they die. That's actually why beer is lower than wine, which is lower than liquor. Grain, most beer is made of grain. In fact, that's what, how we define beer. It's a grain-based alcoholic beverage. Grain doesn't have as much sugar as fruit juice. So yeast, when you smash up your grain and throw it in there, and the yeast will go to work and eat all that's there, but once all the sugar's gone, they're done. They starve to death and hang out and die. And when that happens, it's usually a 4 or 5 or 6 or 7% alcoholic beverage. That's it. That's just all the sugar they got. When it comes to fruit juices, especially grape juice, the one we're gonna focus on for the course, there's a lot more sugar in there. And so the yeast will keep eating and they'll keep producing more alcohol and up until 13, 14, 15, 16% alcohol. That's about the natural limit though, friends, because even if you kept dumping in buckets of cane sugar into your fermenting batch, yeast, the average yeast, the average brewer's yeast, will only go up to about 16, 17, 18% alcohol in solution before the solution itself becomes so toxic it kills the yeast itself. Yeah, I know. They're almost kind of suicidal like that. They'll just keep eating all the sugar and kicking out alcohol until they pollute their own environment so much it kills them. Kind of sounds like humans, but that's a different class and a different lecture. How can liquor be so much stronger than beer and wine then? I just told you yeast can naturally only go to about 17 or 18 percent. Regardless of how much sugar is there, they can only go to 17 or 18 percent ethyl alcohol. How can Jim be 40 percent? How can the most cheap vodkas be 35 percent? Because what distillers do is to take that 5 percent beer or that 15 percent wine and squeeze the water out of it, thereby concentrating the ethyl alcohol that's left there. And I'm, I, I, don't take me literally, they don't squeeze it. They're not sucking it up to a sponge and squeezing it and the water comes out. There are methods by which we distill out the water from the alcoholic beverage, thus the term distilling, distillation, making the ethyl alcohol more pure in solution. And they can then manipulate that from 20% to 40% to 100% if they want. Again, they never go to 100, but most of the alcohol that's produced distilled alcohol, most scotches and whiskeys, they actually get up to 80 or 90% pure ethyl alcohol, but they'll back it down before they send it out to the liquor store for you to buy. They'll actually cut it back with water to take it back down to 40%. And that may, means that they're giving you a beverage that is enjoyable, but won't kill you. Nobody... <laughs> Nobody who produces a product wants you to die while you're doing it. So they're not going to sell you a 90% ethyl alcohol product. The body simply can't handle it. But again, I'm getting back to etiquette now. Let me just back it up and summarize what we've learned about ethyl alcohol here. Three main classes, okay? Uh, and beer is made from grain, okay? So it's an alcoholic beverage produced from pretty much any grain, or the cereals we call them. 
and there are some processes for this, malting, mashing, brewing. Uh, the alcohol content goes anywhere from 4 to 8%. Although people are experimenting and do, doing wildly crazy things in the United States, I've seen 15 and 20% uh, beers, but those are the exception, not the rule, okay? So cereal-based alcoholic beverage, 4 to 8%, it's beer. And again, there's tons of different cereals. Uh, barley and wheat are the ones that you think of most often, but there's uh, uh, oats and rice, huh? sake and maize and millets and sorghum and rye. So there's lots of other things out there that you could add in to make lots of different flavored beers. Ah, back to that plant material being the important part of what differentiates all these alcoholic beverages, even in the beer category. When we get to wine, the general definition of wine is any fruit-based alcoholic beverage. And we're going to talk about grapes, but of course, fruits encompass a wide variety of things from pear to apple to peach to plum and a thousand other things that I haven't mentioned. Liquor takes beer or wine and purifies it. So they take the product of the grain of the grape and those other oddballs and make a basic beer or basic wine and then distill out, pull out the water and possibly mature it in uh, oak barrels. Well, wine may be matured in oak barrels as well. And they therefore, the alcohol content of your average uh, liquor can go anywhere from 25 to say 45%. Of course, I, I forgot to mention alcoholic uh, content of your average wine is uh, uh, 8 to 16, all right? Uh, okay, plant material you start with makes all the, big, the biggest differences. Yeast do their work no matter what. The end game of how much alcohol each of these products have is based on how much sugar you start with, and the processing can tweak it and add lots of different flavors along the way. And I do like to add as a kind of a final summary here, this little graph of you can process and process and process a little bit more to make a variety of alcoholic beverages from the same plant material. Meaning, if we take a basic barley uh, or a rye or even a corn and make it uh, and ferment it, crush it up, mill it, do some things to it, uh, 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 boil it, uh, throw in some yeast and ferment it. Uh, once you've done that, you've made a basic beer and you can taste wild differences between barley beer and wheat beer just because you've chosen different grains, all right? But the end product of that is beer. However, we can then take that beer and distill it into scotch whiskey, or rye whiskey, or bourbon whiskey, or wheat whiskey. Which, side note, most of you think vodka is made from potatoes. No, actually, it's mostly wheat, all right? You can do this with other products as well. You can take rice and make it into a brewed fermented product called sake and distill that into this horrible stuff I've had from Korea and Japan called shochu. Woo! It's like Asian moonshine. Hardcore stuff. You can take the juice of uh, apples or pears and make it into wine and then you can distill that, concentrate the ethyl alcohol, and it turns into brandy. Yeah, I know you've heard of stuff like that. Pears can be turned into perry or pear cider, which can be, be turned into pear brandy. You can make uh, the agave plant into a base beer called pulque. Has anybody ever had pulque? Uh, if you distill pulque, that's how you make tequila or mezcal, depending on where you're at. And you can even do crazy things that I haven't mentioned at all, like honey. Honey can be, because it's a simple sugar, and it can be fermented into what we call mead and then further processed into distilled mead or mead brandy. So, we can do lectures on, individual lectures on beer and even different beer styles if you like, it's up to you. We can do a lecture on distilled products and each one of the distilled products if you like. That's up to you, hit me up on all those things. Uh, and we'll get to the specifics of each one of those alcohol types and those lectures that you request, but, Let's get back to wine. This is supposed to be a general introduction to alcohol. I think I've covered that now. You got the base component of what makes alcoholic beverages alcoholic. So now let's jump into wine. Doing this, we're going to look at first the plant itself, grapes, that we're gonna make into wine, and the process by which we turn grapes into wine. And because most great winemakers, actually all great winemakers would be the first to say this, all great wines start in the vineyard. And so for our class, we will do the same. And we're gonna to jump to the vineyard now and talk about grapes.